Hello and welcome to this Onc Live Peer Exchange entitled Ovarian Cancer Evolving Concepts Around Systemic Therapy. My name is Brad Monk. I'm a gynecologic oncologist here from Phoenix, Arizona, both from the University of Arizona in Creighton as well as U.S. Oncology. Joining me today in this discussion are my colleagues, Tom Herzog from the University of Cincinnati Cancer Institute in Cincinnati. Welcome, Tom. Brad, it's a pleasure to be with you today, and I look forward to a great discussion. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and Dr. Tom Krivak from the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, Allegheny Health Network in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Go Steelers. Thank you, Tommy. Great. Thanks for having me here. Looking forward to a great discussion. It's great. And uh, Dr. Sharon Lewin from Holy Name Medical Center in, in, in Teaneck, New Jersey. Thank you, Sharon, for, for joining us. Thank you for having me. And Dr. Katie Moore. Uh, her title is so long, I'm just going to say where she's from, uh, from the University of Oklahoma uh, in Oklahoma City. But I want to recognize Dr. Moore for her contribution to the Society of Gynecologic Oncology as the program chair this year. She was able to seamlessly transition from an in-person meeting to a virtual meeting. I thank you for that. The scientific uh, exchange was very uh, exciting and informative. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we're here today. We're here today to talk about uh, new presentations, new indications, new studies, new research, uh, innovation from the Society of Gynecologic Oncology 2020 meeting. We're also here because of two indications in ovarian cancer uh, beyond BRCA. This PRIMA study, which was published in the New England Journal in 2019, presented at ESMO 2019. We're going to do a deep dive in what PRIMA maintenance neraparib means to you and your patients. And also PALA1, also presented in Madrid in 2019, ESMO, also published in the New England Journal in 2019, and also what that study means to you, uh, starting with bevacizumab and bevacizumab and maintenance, but adding a lap rib to it in the maintenance phase. So hopefully when you're done here, you will know what you missed at the SGO if you did miss it. And if you didn't miss it, we'll hopefully add some context and we'll hopefully add some, some, some opportunities with these new FDA approvals. Uh, I'm going to begin here by talking about uh, bevacizumab. Bevacizumab was the first targeted therapy to be approved in 2014. Uh, we're going to sort of begin here talking about first-line treatment, and it got approved in June of 2018, first-line. So, Tom Krivak, tell us a little bit about GOG-218 and, and how that led to the FDA approval in 2000. Well, um, thanks, uh, thanks, Brad, uh, for for asking and 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 including me in this 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 uh, uh, conversation. Uh, Two eighteen was obviously we know it was a large randomized trial, about eighteen hundred patients, nineteen hundred patients, three arms. Um, I think it was designed by you and Dr. Berger a long time ago when we were learning about targeted therapies, and it's undergone many publications. Um, the most recent publication um, was 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 the final publication looking at overall survival. So, looking at overall survival, comparing all three groups, um, there was no difference in the overall survival. However, I think that when we need to look at this publication, I think there's a couple things that are really important. One is the stage four group, which did show an improvement in, in overall survival of 10 months, 33 months versus 43 months in the patients who received Bev with Bevacizumab maintenance. I also think it's really important too in that as we go through these discussions, we're going to be talking about HRD and things like that. So some biomarkers in the, the trial, this publication did try to look at HRR genes. It was only in 1,200 of the patients, but to me, I think that you know, as we make some small steps with molecular medicine, we're gonna need some of these, uh, these, these trials to look at uh, how this may uh, affect uh, patient selection for molecular targeted therapy uh, for upfront treatment. So to me, it's slightly different uh, how the label um, with the PFS uh, improvement of, of six months getting maintenance bevacizumab, uh, that's what it was approved on. And the overall survival final paper uh, showed that there was no uh, improvement um, in, in overall survival. So I think that's a, the summary for this, this, this paper at this time. Thanks, buddy. I think it's been an important step forward. Again, it was not a, a big step, but it was an initial baby step. And six months of progression-free survival when bevacizumab is added to chemotherapy and in maintenance for a total of 15 months in some people's minds is impactful. I think certainly in the, in the high-risk subgroup. Um, it, it's, it's most important today, though, because it's a path towards other treatments because we're adding PARP inhibitors to bevacizumab, and if you don't start bevacizumab, you can't add it to it. 
and there'll be a study imminently which we'll talk about which adds immune therapy to bevacizumab. And again, if you don't believe in bevacizumab to the path of that. So uh, we'll talk about what that means in the, in this, in the setting of combination. Tom Herzog, what, what percentage of patients do you think get bevacizumab frontline in the United States today? Yeah, best I can tell, it's probably about 40% right now. Uh, Katie and Sharon, what do you guys think? I would think it's a little higher, um, but 40 may be correct. I think the market data that I've heard has it right about 50%, maybe a little bit higher, um, but that's probably ballpark. Sharon, what do you think? Agreed. The market data that I've heard as well is between 40 and 50%. Yeah, I think one of the things that's interesting is that the, the Medonks use it a little more. The Medonks, I think, uh, were earlier adapters because of the use in colorectal cancer and lung cancer. Uh, I, I really don't have any evidence of that, but um, certainly that, 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 that has been my uh, observation.